Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start on my review of The Wind Up Bird Chronicle by Haruki Murakami. So I picked this up as a buddy read with Charles Heathcote. Be sure to check out his channel and some of his books as well. Uh, as usual, I've tabbed it out, so I'm going to read you the blurb and then I'm going to go through, pick up some of my tabs and then share my overall thoughts and a rating at the end. It might be a bit of a beast because there are already a lot of tabs and I'm only a quarter of the way through at the, the time of filming this part of the review. Toro Okada's cat has disappeared and his wife is growing more distant every day. Then there are the increasingly explicit telephone calls he has started receiving. As this compelling story unfolds, the tidy suburban realities of Okada's vague and blameless life, spent cooking, reading, listening to jazz and opera and drinking beer at the kitchen table, are turned inside out, and he embarks on a bizarre journey, guided by a succession of characters, each with a tale to tell. So let's go in and get started. We read this, by the way, we read it um, three chapters a day. Although we started out one chapter a day, then moved up to two, and then moved up to three and backdated it all, because basically because I wanted to finish it by the end of the month. Uh, this, is translated fro uh, this is translated from the Japanese by Jay Rubin. Rubin is my favorite Murakami translator as well, so that's always a good sign. So here we get the, uh, the, the cat from the title, I suppose. Um, I'm looking for my cat, I explained, wiping a sweaty palm on my trousers. It's been gone for a week. Somebody saw it around here somewhere. What kind of cat? A big tom. Brown stripes. Tip of the tail a little bent. Name? Noburu. Noburu Wataya. No, not your name. The cat's. That is my cat's name. Oh, very impressive. Well, actually, it's my brother-in-law's name. The cat reminds us of him. We gave the cat his name just for fun. How does the cat remind you of him? I don't know, just in general, the way it walks. It has this blank stare. And then we have this little conversation here, which I want to highlight. I read it in the paper the other day. I meant to tell you about it, but I forgot. It was in an interview with a vet. Apparently horses are tremendously influenced by the phases of the moon, both physically and emotionally. Their brain waves go wild as the full moon approaches and they start having all kinds of physical problems. Then, on the night itself, a lot of them get sick and a huge number die. Nobody really knows why this happens, but the statistics prove that it does. Horse vets never have time to sleep on full moon nights, they're so busy. Interesting, said Kumiko. An eclipse of the sun is even worse though. Nothing short of a tragedy for horses. You can't begin to imagine how many horses die on the day of a total eclipse. Anyhow, all I want to say is that right this second, horses are dying all over the world. Compared with that, it's no big deal if you take out your frustrations on somebody. So don't let it bother you. Think about the horses dying. Think about them lying on the straw in some barn under the full moon, foaming at the mouth, gasping in agony. We have a character called uh, Malta Kano, and she says, The Kano is real, but the Malta is a professional name I took from the island of Malta. They talk about if, if they've ever been. I've been to Malta on a work Christmas party. It was very drunken. And I thought this was kind of a damning indictment. I mean, Murakami's kind of known for his not having the best attitude towards women. I mean, he is kind of an old guy as well, but um, this is kind of one of the problems in society when people kind of sweep rape under the carpet I guess so bear in mind this is like the male character uh, so they say they're not gonna bring a formal complaint on the matter or go to the police and he says I felt relief on hearing this not that it would have bothered me in the least if Noburo Wataya had been convicted of rape and sent to prison it couldn't happen to a nicer guy but Kumiko's brother was a rather well-known figure his arrest and trial would be certain to make the headlines, and that would be a terrible shock for Kumiko. If only for my own mental well-being, I preferred the whole thing to go away. thought this was an interesting little sentence. Grammar is like the air. Someone higher up might try to set the rules for its use. People won't necessarily follow them. I think this is quite prescient, because this is about our world at the moment, and kind of our political landscape as well. And so Noburu Watawa came to be seen as one of the most intelligent figures of the day. Nobody seemed to care about consistency anymore. All they looked for on the tube were the bouts of intellectual gladiators. The redder the blood they drew, the better. It didn't matter if the same person said one thing on Monday and the opposite on Thursday. I thought this was an incredibly specific example. If the Dalai Lama were on his deathbed and the jazz musician Eric Dolphy were to try to explain to him the importance of choosing one's engine oil in accordance with changes in the sound of the bass clarinet, that exchange might have been more worthwhile and effective than my conversations with Noboru Wataya. And then in... Um, this is kind of crazy, this talking about some of the practicalities of committing suicide, I suppose. He says, uh, Now that it was too late, I realised that to do myself in, I should have rented a car with the proper insurance. At the same time, of course, insurance was the last thing on my mind. It never occurred to me that my brother's car wouldn't be insured or that I would fail to kill myself. I ran into a stone wall at 100 miles an hour. It was amazing that I survived. 
A short time later, I received a bill from the Condominium Association for the repair of the wall. They were demanding 1,364,294 yen, immediately, in cash. All I could do was borrow it from my father. He was willing to give it to me in the form of a loan, but he insisted that I pay him back. My father was very proper when it came to money matters. He said it was my responsibility for having caused the accident, and he expected me to pay him back in full and on schedule. In fact, at the time, he had very little money to spare. He was in the process of expanding his clinic and was having trouble raising the money for the project. It was interesting, they were talking about wigs um, and wig makers, and one of the characters says, Once a guy starts using a wig, he has to keep using one. It's like his fate. That's why the wig makers make such huge profits. I hate to say it, but they're like drug dealers. Once they get their hooks into a customer, he's a customer for life. There's a character here, and um, I thought this was a good observation. She filled the tub, stuck her face in, and drowned herself. You realise, of course, that to die that way, you have to be pretty damn determined. I actually think it's impossible. It's meant to be impossible to drown or suffocate yourself. Your body just automatically fights back against it. I mean, obviously, you can drown yourself. You can do like a Virginia Woolf and fill your pockets with stones and walk into a river. But even then, when you were drowning, at the end of it, your body would still automatically try to reach for the surface. This little exchange here is very Murakami. Kimiko wrapped two used cotton swabs in a tissue and threw them in the wastebasket. Basket. Then she raised her head and looked straight at me. I once saw him masturbating. I opened the door and there he was. So what? Everybody masturbates, I said. No, you don't understand, she said. Then she sighed. It happened maybe two years after my sister died. He was probably in college and I was about eight. My mother had wavered between getting rid of my sister's things and stowing them away, and in the end she decided to keep them, thinking I might wear them when I got older. She had put them in a box in a wardrobe. My brother had taken them out and was smelling them and doing it. It's dark. Masturbating over your dead sister's clothes. The two of you will almost certainly die here, the Russian went on slowly, a phrase at a time, as if speaking to children. And it will be a terrible death. They... And here the Russian glanced towards the Mongolian soldiers. The big one, holding the machine gun, looked at me with a snaggletooth grin. They love to kill people in ways that involve great difficulty in imagination. They are, shall we say, aficionados. Since the days of Genghis Khan, the Mongols have enjoyed devising particularly cruel ways of killing people. We Russians are painfully aware of this. It forms part of our history lessons in school. We study what the Mongols did when they invaded Russia. They killed millions, for no reason at all. They captured hundreds of Russian aristocrats in Kiev and killed them all together. Do you know that story? They cut huge thick planks, laid the Russians beneath them, and held a banquet on top of the planks, crushing them to death beneath their weight. Ordinary human beings would never think of such a thing, don't you agree? It took time and a tremendous amount of preparation. Who else would have gone to the trouble? But they did it. And why? Because it was a form of amusement to them. And they still enjoy doing such things. I saw them in action once. I thought I had seen some terrible things in my day. But that night, as you can imagine, I lost my appetite. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? Am I speaking too quickly? Alright, and this is the bit that when I was reading it, I was trying to hint... Well, I was telling Charlie to t let me know when he got to it. And I said it was the peeled peach bit. Uh, I'm just going to read this out to you. It's really well written, I think, but it's also brutal, like trigger warnings if you're queasy. So this is quite a long, long old chunk here, but I think it's worth reading. Because for me, this is like the highlight of the whole book. This man is one of those professionals of whom I spoke, said the Russian officer. I want you to look at this knife closely. It is a very special knife designed for skinning, and it is extraordinarily well made. The blade is as thin and sharp as a razor, and the technical skill these people bring to the task is extremely high. They've been skinning animals for thousands of years after all. They can take a man's skin off the way you'd peel a peach. Beautifully, without a single scratch. Am I speaking too quickly for you by any chance? Yamamoto said nothing. They do a small area at a time, said the Russian officer. They have to work slowly if they want to remove the skin cleanly without any scratches. If, in the meantime, you feel you want to say something, please let me know. Then you won't have to die. Our man here has done this several times and never once has he failed to make the person talk. Keep that in mind. The sooner we stop, the better for both of us. Holding his knife, the bear-like Mongolian officer looked at Yamamoto and grinned. To this day I remember that smile. I see it in my dreams. I have never been able to forget it. No sooner had he flashed this smile than he set to work. His men held Yamamoto down with their hands and knees while he began skimming Yamamoto with the utmost care. It truly was like skinning a peach. I couldn't bear to watch. I closed my eyes. When I did this, one of the soldiers hit me with his rifle butt. He went on hitting me until I opened my eyes. But it hardly mattered. Eyes opened or closed, I could still hear Yamamoto's voice. He bore the pain without a whimper, at first, but soon he began to scream. I had never heard such screams before. They did not seem part of this world. The man started by slitting open Yamamoto's shoulder and proceeded to peel off the skin of his right arm from the top down, 
slowly, with care, almost with love. As the Russian officer had said, it was something like a work of art. One would never have imagined there was any pain involved if it weren't for the screams. But the screams told the horrendousness of the pain that accompanied the work. Before long, the entire skin of Yamamoto's right arm had come off in a single thin sheet. The skinner handed it to the man beside him, who held it open in his fingertips, circulating among the others to give them a good look. All the while, blood kept dripping from the skin. Then the officer turned to Yamamoto's left arm, repeating the procedure. After that, he skinned both legs, cut off the penis and testicles, and removed the ears. Then he skinned the head and the face and everything else. Yamamoto lost consciousness, regained it, and lost it again. The screams would stop whenever he passed out and continue whenever he came to again, but his voice gradually weakened and finally gave out altogether. All this time, the Russian officer drew meaningless patterns on the ground with the heel of his boot. The Mongolian soldiers watched the procedure in silence. Their faces remained expressionless, showing neither disgust nor excitement nor shock. They watched Yamamoto's skin being removed a piece at a time with the, with the same kind of faces we might have if we were out for a stroll and stopped to have a look at a construction site. Meanwhile, I did nothing but vomit, over and over again. Long after it seemed there was nothing more for me to bring up, I continued to vomit. At last, the bear-like Mongolian officer held up the skin of Yamamoto's torso, which he had so cleanly peeled off. Even the nipples were intact. Never to this day have I seen anything so horrible. Someone took the skin from him and spread it out to dry the way we might dry a sheet. All that remained lying on the ground was Yamamoto's corpse, a bloody red lump of meat from which every trace of skin had been removed. The most painful sight was the face. Two large white eyeballs stared out from the red mass of flesh. Teeth bared, the mouth stretched wide open as if in a shout. Two little holes were all that remained where the nose had been removed. The ground was a sea of blood. The Russian officer spat on the ground and looked at me. Then he took a handkerchief from his pocket and wiped his mouth. The fellow really didn't know anything, did he? He said, putting the handkerchief back. His voice sounded somewhat flatter than it had before. If he had known, he would have talked. Pity. But in any case, the man was a professional. He was bound to have an ugly death sooner or later. And if he knew nothing, there's no way that you could know anything. And then basically, he, he then gets chucked down a well, and I thought this was an interesting observation. Wells are also like a recurring theme throughout as well, but um, yeah, here we go. I lay still, enduring the pain. Before I knew it, tears were streaming down my cheeks. Tears of pain, and even more, tears of despair. I don't think you will ever be able to understand what it's like. The utter loneliness, the feeling of desperation. To be abandoned in a deep well in the middle of the desert at the edge of the world, overcome with intense pain and total darkness. I went so far as to regret that the Mongolian non-com had not simply shot me and got it over with. If I had been killed that way, at least they would have been aware of my death. If I died here, however, it would be a truly lonely death. A death of no concern to anyone. A silent death. There's a reference here to A Farewell to Arms by Ernest Hemingway, which is actually sitting around on my uh, TBR. I haven't picked it up yet. I thought this was just an interesting observation on other people. Because uh, this is the kind of thing I think when I look at other people. The neighbourhood looked a little different. The people I passed on the street all had an unnatural, even artificial look. I examined each face as I walked by, and I wondered what kind of people these could be. What kind of houses did they live in? What kind of families did they have? What kind of lives did they lead? Did they sleep with women other than their wives, or men other than their husbands? Were they happy? Did they know how unnatural and artificial they looked? They're not real, man. They're just fucking simulations from the Matrix. We have a chapter called The Monkeys of Shitty Island, which I joked on my Instagram would be a good title for my uh, non-fiction book about how the Brits ruined the rest of the world, basically. We get this little bit of dialogue. Do you know the story of the monkeys of the shitty island? I asked Nabarro Wataya. He shook his head with no sign of interest. Never heard of it. Somewhere, far, far away, there's a shitty island. An island without a name. An island not worth giving a name. A shitty island with a shitty shape. On this shitty island grow palm trees that also have shitty shapes. And the palm trees produce coconuts that give off a shitty smell. Shitty monkeys live in the trees, and they love to eat these shitty smelling coconuts, after which they shit the world's foulest shit. The shit falls on the ground and builds up shitty mounds, making the shitty palm trees that grow on them even shittier. It's an endless cycle. And that is how you get a YouTube video demonetized, ladies and gentlemen. Thought this was an interesting thought trail here. Uh, if people live forever, if they never got any older, if they could just go on living in this world, never dying, always healthy, do you think they'd bother to think hard about things the way we're doing now? I mean, we think about just about everything, more or less. Philosophy, psychology, logic, religion, literature. I think if there were no such thing as death, that complicated thoughts and ideas like that would never come into the world. I mean, one of the characters says something which I relate to. Have you ever had that feeling that you'd like to go to a whole different place and become a whole different self? Okay, so here's another section I want to read out. It's a, a page here. Um, page 322 in my edition. You mean you don't think much about death, Mr. Wind-Up Bird? 
I do think about death, of course, but not all the time. Just once in a while, like most people. Here's what I think, Mr. Windup Bird, said Maker Sahara. Everybody's born with some different thing at the core of their existence, and that thing, whatever it is, becomes like a heat source that runs each person from the inside. I have one too, of course, like everybody else, but sometimes it gets out of hand. It swells or shrinks inside me, and it shakes me up. What I'd really like to do is find a way to communicate that feeling to another person, but I can't seem to do it. They just don't get it. Of course, the problem could be that I'm not explaining it very well, but I think it's because they're not listening very well. They pretend to be listening, but they're not really. So I get worked up sometimes, and I do some crazy things. Crazy things? Like, say, trapping you in the well. Or, like, when I'm riding on the back of a motorcycle, putting my hands over the eyes of the guy who's driving. When she said this, she touched the wound next to her eye. And that's how the motorcycle accident happened, I asked. May Kasahara gave me a questioning look, as if she had not heard me. I couldn't make out the expression in her eyes behind the dark glasses, but a kind of numbness seemed to have spread over her face, like oil poured on still water. What happened to the guy? I asked. With her cigarette between her lips, May Kasahara continued to look at me, or rather, she continued to look at my mark. Do I have to answer that question, Mr. Windup Bird? Not if you don't want to. You're the one who brought it up. If you don't want to talk about it, then don't. May Kasahara grew very quiet. She seemed to be having trouble deciding what to do. Then she drew in a chest full of cigarette smoke and let it out slowly. With a heavy movement, she dragged her sunglasses off and turned her face to the sun, eyes closed tight. Watching her, I felt as if the flow of time was slowing down little by little, as if time's spring were beginning to run down. He died, she said at last, in a voice with no expression, as though she had resigned herself to something. He died? May Kasahara tapped the ash off her cigarette. Then she picked up her towel and wiped the sweat from her face over and over again. Finally, as if recalling a task that she had forgotten, she said in a clipped, business-like way. We were going pretty fast. It happened near Enoshima. Then we get a reference to someone's skin peeling like the skin of an apple. It's all, all the fruits. So I thought this was quite a fun little, quirky little quote here. And uh, it then got picked up again towards the end. There's a reading guide at the end with some, some questions for discussion. And one of them was based around this quote here. I'm just going to read this uh, paragraph out. This is from one of the uh, letters. May Kasahara's point of view, number four. A stupid tree frog daughter. I don't know, maybe the world has two different kinds of people, and for one kind the world is this logical rice pudding place, and for the other it's all hit or miss macaroni cheese. I bet if those tree frog parents of mine put rice pudding mix in the microwave and got macaroni cheese when the bell rang, they'd just tell themselves, oh we must have put in macaroni cheese mix by mistake. Or they'd take out the macaroni cheese and try to convince themselves, this looks like macaroni cheese, but actually it's rice pudding. And if I tried to be nice and explain to them that sometimes when you put in rice pudding mix you get macaroni cheese, they would never believe me, they'd probably just get mad. I thought this was amusing. This kind of dates the book because um, basically we're talking about having a, a conversation over a computer network and he goes, uh, I'd say there are some practical problems standing in the way. Oh, and what might those be? Well, first of all, how can I be sure the other person is Kamiko? When you're talking on the computer screen, you can't see other people's faces or hear their voices. Someone else could be sitting at the keyboard pretending to be, to, pretending to be Kamiko. I see what you mean, said Ushikawa, sounding impressed. I never thought of that. Webcam! Get a fucking webcam! I mean, this was published in 1995, but still, get a webcam! And uh, I want to read this little paragraph out, because I think this is a great illustration of Murakami's... Like, his way with words, when he's describing some stuff, it's... it's he's just got a way of being really brutal, um, that's quite effective. It was late in 1975 when Nutmeg was 40 and Cinnamon 11 that her husband was killed. His body was found in a Nakasaka hotel room, slashed to bits. The maid found him when she used a passkey to enter the room for cleaning at 11 in the morning. The lavatory looked as if it had been the site of a bloodbath. The body itself had been virtually drained dry, and it was missing its heart and stomach and liver and both kidneys and pancreas, as if whoever had killed him had cut those organs out and taken them somewhere in plastic bags or some such containers. The head had been severed from the torso and placed on the lid of the toilet. Facing outward, the face chopped to mincemeat. So quite, I thought this was quite funny, just the way this girl talked about her, her about potentially killing herself. I know you shouldn't laugh about that. But she said, um, so finally I stayed in this high class hotel slash jail slash country school for only one term. When I got home for the spring break, I announced to my parents that if I had to go back there, I was going to kill myself. I'd stuff three tampons down my throat and drink tons of water. I'd slash my wrists. I'd dive headfirst off the school roof. And I meant what I said. I wasn't kidding. So um, these army soldiers are forced to kill some of the animals in the zoo. And they're particularly worried about the elephants. And then we get to this bit here. Um, in the end, they did not kill the elephants. Once they confronted them, it became obvious that the beast was simply too large. The soldiers' rifles looked like silly toys in their presence. 
The lieutenant thought it over for a while and decided to leave the elephants alone. Hearing this, the men breathed a sigh of relief. Strange as it may seem, or perhaps it does not seem so strange. They all had the same thought. It was so much easier to kill humans on the battlefield than animals in cages, even if, on the battlefield, one might end up being killed oneself. And we get some newspaper reports uh, about this house, and one of them says, uh, People arrive and depart exclusively in the large Mercedes with tinted windows. In other words, for some reason, they do not want their faces seen under any circumstances. What could be the reason for this? Why must they go to so much trouble and expense in order to do what they do in total secrecy? I mean, if they're driving around in a large black Mercedes... I don't know. It doesn't seem like a major inconvenience if they already had the Mercedes, you know? <laughs> it seems like a leap to say that they didn't want to be seen under any circumstances. Like, they might just like travelling in their Mercedes. We get this very odd little interchange here. What I'd really like to ask you about is something that somebody whispered to me the other day. That you have a brother-in-law who's a famous young politician. Is it true? Unfortunately, it is, I said. My wife's brother. Well, yeah, no shit, your wife's brother. How else would you have a brother-in-law? I suppose it could be your husband's brother. Uh, there's a biography of Murakami as well. I think this is quite a good way of describing him. Known for his surrealistic world of mysterious women, cats, earlobes, wells, Western culture, music, and quirky first-person narratives, Murakami is now Japan's best-known novelist abroad. And I, what I didn't know, um, this is quite an impressive little summary of his achievements. Murakami's books are currently published in more than 40 languages. Plays for the stage and feature-length films have been made of several of his short stories. He is the translator into Japanese of J.D. Salinger, John Irving, R Raymond Carver, Truman Capote and F. Scott Fitzgerald. He begins writing at 5am each day, leaving his afternoons free for translation work, journalism and his other great passion, running. And I thought it was just funny at the end, it's got further reading and related works and... Um, one of them in particular, Cloud Atlas by David Mitchell, I can definitely see the similarities because it's like a lot of interrelated narratives. But I thought I'd give you the full list here because it's kind of interesting. Uh, so we have The Master of Margarita by Mikhail Bulgakov, not read, would like to one day. Where I'm Calling From by Raymond Carver, not read. Catch-22 by Joseph Heller, not read, want to read soon. A Prayer for Owen Meany by John Irving, not read, want to read someday. Metamorphosis and Other Stories by Franz Kafka, have read. Brightness Falls by Jay McKerney, haven't read, haven't heard of. Cloud Atlas by David Mitchell, have read. A Void by Georges Perrick, which I haven't read, haven't heard of. And Slaughterhouse Five by Kurt Vonnegut, which I think I haven't read, but I have read some Vonnegut and I want to read it soon. And then non fiction, Murakami and the Music of Words by Jay Rubin, which would be quite interesting because Rubin's his translator, and as I said at the start of this video, he's actually my favourite Murakami translator. Overall then, I did enjoy reading this. I think it was probably made more enjoyable because of the buddy read. I actually enjoyed the first half of it more, and I can't help but wonder whether that's because we took it in chunks, you know, and so for the first half of it, I was reading a few chapters a day, whereas for the second half, or about this much of it towards the end, I just sort of powered through, because Charlie had already finished without me. But yeah, I uh, enjoyed it quite a lot. I gave it a 4.5 out of 5. It will probably, almost certainly, in fact, be in my top 10 books of the quarter. And um, this is like the longest Murakami I've read so far, but... I think, um, I mean, Murakami's just a great writer in any format, really, but, yeah, he didn't let me down with a longer form. Like, sometimes you read a longer novel by some writer and it just doesn't quite hold up, but, yeah, Murakami nailed it. So, yeah, but that's what I thought of The Wind-Up Bird Chronicle by Haruki Murakami. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book and, if so, what you thought of it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more. I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.